Hello and welcome to another episode here on my channel. My name is Chaos Mole and today we are watching Power On, the story of Xbox, chapter 3, not 2, 3, and it didn't turn on. And we will see what is this about. Uh, if you haven't seen this before, there are two more chapters before this and there will be three more chapters after this. And it's all about the story of Xbox and how Xbox basically started out as an idea and then became the thing it is today. And I'm reacting live to it. And I would say we are getting right to it and see what they have to tell. The chapter two was basically ending with, yes, they are doing an Xbox. Uh, they presented it. It did go well. And then they realized, well, shoot, it's a Microsoft product. Well, that's not good, especially not in the early 2000s, where a lot of people were like using Microsoft products, but because they more or less had to. Yeah. So we will see how this continues and how they are probably releasing a new console to the world. So let's see what they have to say. And let's jump right into it. Let's go. The new contender in the video game wars. Xbox is going to be the future, truly the future of video games. Oh, God. Xbox. Taking over the living this room. Scene. Limitless. Yeah. Connected digital entertainment. You guys never understood. The company is going to face fierce competition. Sniper! <gasps> it's a ticking time bomb. Makes me oh, very boy. nervous to actually play this for you. Xbox getting a major overhaul. Yeah, I'm really curious to the, the um, to the Xbox 360, which was basically the heydays, and Xbox One, which was everything but the heydays so i'm curious to see where this is going but let's have a look at the original the xbox Xbox is a breakthrough game console that ships in fall 2001. most console companies start working on the next console years as soon as they finish the current console yes so that's what Microsoft years, does. Six years, seven years. So for Microsoft to go from announcing in 2000 to being on store shelves in the fall of 2001 is kind of insane. Yeah. Before Xbox landed on store shelves, the team had to run a gauntlet yeah. of very public deadlines. A hardware rollout in Las Vegas at the Consumer Electronics Show. A first glimpse of Xbox games at Microsoft's GameStock event in Seattle. It was kind of insane. And finally, an the table they basically the entire had. global gaming industry together to see what was new and judge it mercilessly. E3 is the biggest moment of the year for games. For uh, the entrance, it was really important to uh, show up. Back, back in the day, yes. Nowadays, now, was it's like, Xbox, uh, But, you know, a lot of what you're showing is beta software and beta hardware. Hardware that's not proven yet or probably not even finished. A lot of things. At E3 can go wrong. Oh yeah. Adding pressure, especially back in the day. On Xbox yep. development, Rick Thompson had just left Microsoft, which meant Microsoft's Whoops. mission to quickly deliver an industry-changing game console needed a new leader. The idea of finding somebody else externally didn't make sense. We had a schedule that is crazy to begin with. The project just didn't have the time for that. Hey, Nor Payne. did we think that somebody externally could sort of fit into Microsoft and make this happen. And so. I concluded that it was something I needed to do. A new challenger enters. Sort of a, a fateful decision because it led to the worst 18 months of my professional career. Oh boy. It's a hard project. I mean, what we were doing is something that is intensely difficult. Robbie was, Robbie was the grown up. What's Robbie's role? Ooh. We were a young group <laughs> of kind of ragtag kids. Let's go ahead and take the cars, give them three. What the hell's that? You know, I got a demo to do up here. <laughs> I don't think Robbie should be seeing this. <laughs> what we needed more than anything else is we needed an adult in the room. I was uh. part of Office when it was, was smaller and then as it grew big. Robbie also has a sense of propriety and I don't think we had a sense of propriety at all. The opportunity here way off pace. You, you sometimes need very exciting. He was the core the guy. Of Microsoft, that Bill Gates trusted oh, with all the complexity and the cost and the risk involved in doing something like this. Robbie is a good guy. People can trust him. He doesn't break his word. However, everyone who comes into games can't be prepared for what it's like because it's an entertainment business. The software doesn't just have to work and have the right features. It has to entertain also. This I think hard. I had no. This is something the gaming industry as a whole is failing nowadays a little bit more. We are getting more and more people 
coming from completely opposite industries who have no idea and absolutely no understanding on the game you're creating here has to entertain. And it's not just there to sell. And the gaming industry as a whole seems to move more and more in that direction of here's the new Assassin's Creed. Buy it. Okay, why? What's the gameplay like? How does it feel? Like, what can we expect from it? What? It's Assassin's Creed. You you were buying for the you you're paying for the name. It's like Apple, right? Like, you're giving us money because it's Assassin's Creed. I was like, no, I'm buying this product to have some fun after work or whatever I have been doing, and I know that's not how it works. But we see more and more people realizing there is money to be made in the gaming industry. But they have no interest to create products which are fun for us, the gamers. And it's really painful to see. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that people of other parts of the industry are not allowed to go into the gaming industry. If you were dedicated and you were like, yeah, I want to add something to the gaming industry. I want to do something better. I want to learn, right? That's all fine. Like, I mean, I'm coming from basically a non-gaming background back in the day. My job had nothing to do with gaming, my daytime job. and But it's all like being committed to something. But a lot of people who are coming now into the gaming industry, they only see the money lying on the ground and they're like, how can we get even more money out of this without thinking a single moment about gaming? No clue what I was doing. And that's the problem. I didn't play games. The business model I barely understood. Yeah. We are launching an entirely new business competing against two established competitors in one of the largest entertainment industries in the world. I was learning something new every single day. And, and he that, is that, learning. I failed most days too. And I think the next six to eight weeks are going to be super exciting. A little challenging. I didn't think about how to plan for going from 20 people to 2,000 people. We wow. went from four people to a dozen people to hundreds to honestly thousands involved in some way with the creation of Xbox. It was crazy. I mean, it was no time at all before I didn't know everybody in the organization anymore. When I think about it today, it just makes my head kind of spin sideways. Every week I would hear about somebody I knew in the game industry that was moving up to Redmond to work for the Xbox. We just said, this all has to get done. We need bodies. Yep. So we hired people in bulk. We brought in teams of people. I remember thinking, there's a lot of people changing their lives for this effort. It's either got to be something that everybody believes in, and they're willing to uproot their families and get behind this initiative, or it's going to be one of the biggest... Failures. ...cluster <laughs> of all time. And the train is not stopping. We needed our own place because we were just going to bust at the seams. So Microsoft has this beautiful campus and all these beautiful buildings and everyone works together. We were not part of that. <laughs> this campus called Millennium, which was still in Redmond, but pretty far away from Microsoft. Wow. Part of that was we needed space, but part of it is like, we need a few miles away from main campus to get some breathing room to do something different. Hmm. We were deliberately a renegade team. They were rebels inside of the Microsoft empire. We were kids in our early 20s who loved video games and could not believe that Microsoft had given us jobs to go create them. And we were all kind of growing up together. The thing about games is it's Hollywood for nerds. You have yeah. your star directors, you have your Ferrari driving rendering engineers. Congratulations. And, after and a full I day sometimes feel that gets games, more and more lost we nowadays. And, play games. and there was a little bit of a weird culture of not leaving, which I think was maybe not the healthiest. No. Maybe like a college dorm room kind of vibe. Your yeah. social circle was Xbox. Your family was kind of Xbox. But we all had a common purpose, a passion this around This is my games. family. Being able to do something very different. But John, those are just Xboxes. Where you were getting yes. energy from. Because we were family. still young. We had moments where we were like, wait a minute. Like, am I the best person to be doing this? Yeah. <laughs> 
I think a lot of people who are starting in the gaming industry make that realization later on that they are like, am I, should I do this? Yeah. You know, I always call it the best funded startup ever. Me in my 20s, you know, I had millions, millions of dollars of budget and there wasn't really any oversight. It was a little bit yep. of the wild west. You know, I had to negotiate all the components that went in, hard drives, power supplies, the circuit board. Here I am, this kid, negotiating these deals that are you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. There were definitely some terrible decisions being made. But on the other hand, that level of freedom, you know, made Xbox happen. What resulted was sort of a weird I think it's of craziness. And what genius. Xbox needed back in the day. My recollection of that time was being so fascinated by watching this big company around oh, us Joseph try Stephen. to wrap its brain around what it meant to be an entertainment brand. Yeah. We didn't have a lot of interdependencies with the rest of the company. It was Robbie, right, that had to go over to main campus and deal with Microsoft people. One day, some executives came to visit the studio, and one of those people who came was Bill Gates. I showed him my cinematic tools and how I wrote scripts and how I laid down cameras in the engine. Uh, Bill spent time with Marty O'Donnell, our audio director. Chief, whatever you're gonna do, make it quick. Rain it alien! <laughs> oh, Jesus, why you do this to me? <laughs> the hopes of all the Covenant rest on your shoulders, Chieftain. He spent time actually watching Marty play some of the themes from Halo. Be a tut. Be a pop. <laughs> It's kind of cool to see now. I've, I've never seen this footage. We went to go see our art department where one of our 3D artists was sculpting a character in clay, making a maquette. And at the end of the Bill visit, we got in the conference room, the leads of the studio, and there was a pause. And uh -oh. you can see the magnificent machine that is his brain calculating down the Microsoft org chart from him at the top all the way down to the crazy artists in this studio. Crazy artists. Pit, literally. And Bill leaned forward and he said, so, there are artists who work here? It really was a cultural change for the company. Xbox was already forcing people within Microsoft to think differently. Huh. But what really mattered was changing public perception. Behind the scenes, yeah. software engineers were hard at work building Xbox's capabilities. Like now, the hardware team had a chance to win over the doubters. Especially on the here in Europe. At the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. <sighs> It was a tough, a show, tough where companies fight. from around the world will come to unveil the latest in technologies. Especially because Microsoft didn't do so well show here for the holiday season, and so we had a lot of proving to do. The press was skeptical, gamers were skeptical. You don't know how to do this stuff. You've never done this before. Good luck. The gaming industry is not a believer. While Microsoft works on the insides of the new Xbox, well, that has changed a bit. An equal amount of attention on the outside. I was the creative director of Xbox. Horace Luke is the man. <laughs> Horace Luke is the man. What Horace had to do was take the thing that we had produced in hardware and then figure out some wrapping around it. Oof. The first time we ever showed him like, hey, you're gonna need to put this board that we're about to manufacture for you know millions of consoles into something that the looks bolts. good. He's like, what the f My office was <laughs> where everybody brought their ideas from the technology team, to the design team, to the management team. At the time that we were building the original Xbox, there were no other consoles with a hard drive or an ethernet port. So yeah. how do we put something around this that vents heat, that survives a drop test? You could say that Xbox cool. was yeah, really the first truly into a box that's not going to be PC in, in your living room as a it console. Was a constant battle between the different groups. I went through thousands of different sketches trying to like when, when you look at PlayStation 2, PlayStation 1, the Sega consoles, right? Like Sega Dreamcast and all that. They were still just consoles. They had a disk drive, they had somewhere a memory card, right? And, well, they had, of course, like the hardware they need to render all of this. But it wasn't, it wasn't really a PC. Not by a long shot. And Xbox was like the first product who actually was PC hardware parts through and through wrapped in a portable design for the time.
you know. And I can I can see how back in the early 2000s that was a huge thing and definitely not easy. Jam it and shrink it in every way possible into a box. Yeah, I remember him saying like, well, maybe we just got to slim it down. Like, you know, we'll just dress it in black. Everything was very aggressive looking. The console itself was large. It was yeah. bulging on the top. It looked like the, the engine cowling on a Dodge Hemi. It was the physical embodiment of power like no other console has ever been. It took me, like by this. the way, years to realize that to fit everything in that box. Look, the top part to the was an X. But in comparison to the PC of the 90s, it was tiny. Oh, yeah. It is a small miracle that we actually were able to pull this off. And it looked awesome. Well, it looked all right. And then the controller came around. To do every new gadget and gizmo about to hit stores. CES 2001 in Las Vegas in the convention center hall. Bill Gates was there. CES will actually give us a better idea of just where Microsoft is going to fit into the gaming market. For the very first time, Microsoft was going to get to show off its final Xbox hardware design. Good morning. Welcome I to CES. This. Everybody felt like we were on the verge of doing something special, historic. Uh, for the first time, let me now unveil Xbox. That controller, man. When you show up as the third. <laughs> I'm sorry, that, the space, that controller was with shit. Well established competitors. You have to break out, you have to be bold. How do you unveil a product in a way that might surprise the world and get the world to see Microsoft doing something differently? If you smell what the rock is cooking. Yeah. We decided to bring The Rock to CES. There was honestly some disbelief, like, you know, Bill Gates. The there Rock, was. Like, what's going on here? Man. Thank you, thank you, Bill. It was really like muscle bound Hollywood meets, you know, gamer geek. I mean, it was funny. It just might appear that The Rock and it was Bill funny. Gates don't have a heck of a lot in common. <laughs> <laughs> Well, The Rock's here to say that that can't be farther from the truth. The Xbox is everything The Rock is. Cutting edge, powerful, exhilarating. And they were funny together. Like, it actually worked. And they looked like they were best friends. I mean, The Rock doesn't impress easily, Bill, you know that. But I'm pretty damn impressed with what we're seeing here today. And considering that this there were Xbox also a lot of awkward parts. On one -fifth of the system's but... power, it's very impressive. Uh, Bill, do you have any idea what the rock would be like if he were only running on one fifth of his power? Well, I, I would think that- It doesn't matter what you think, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry, Bill, it, it's, it's just a force of habit. Rock apologizes. It went well. We showed nothing, technically, but it started to build the excitement. Yeah. We gave it five out of five stars. We really like the Xbox a lot. You throw in an eight gigabyte hard drive, a 10-100 ethernet adapter, and you basically have the most powerful system on the block. Uh, the Xbox is really slick. With excitement building around the console, Microsoft was under tremendous pressure to build a portfolio of hit games before the Xbox launch. Yeah. By the time they had announced that they wanted to do Xbox to the time when we needed to launch was an incredibly short period of time. We didn't really have the luxury of saying, start building a game from ground up. That was almost impossible. What we were looking Especially for game development took like five years. Already in development. We went out and started to look for developers Which was pretty all over common the world. back in the day. Barnstorming tour across North America, Europe, and ultimately Japan to create some sort of excitement around the console and convince game developers in particular that we could be successful. All right, boys, let's roll. One day we presented a new idea from a, a small game publisher that had come to us and said, hey, we want to dust off one of the 2D games that we had done for PC. We're going to really invest in it. We think it's going to be really exciting. And these newly important executives in Xbox who would review all the pitches from publishers and developers, they said, I don't think that game is going to be able to make the transition from 2D to 3D. GTA. They felt that it was complicated. They didn't really understand the user interface. They thought that it was based on a game that hadn't been all that successful. To my surprise, it was rejected. And that game was called Grand Theft Auto 3. Yeah. It ended up selling 14 and a half million units. 
It was the top selling game of 2001 and would have been the top selling game of 2002 if it wasn't beaten by its own sequel. It was the pass heard around the industry. Despite seeing Grand Theft Auto 3 go to PlayStation, Microsoft was still well positioned to attract other developers to its platform. Yeah. We needed a vibrant and strong third party lineup of games that customers would love. And we wanted the industry to look at us as something that was going to be worthy of development. We wanted to have was probably the very a big best mistake. Games. On March 13, 2001, Microsoft put their commitment to developers on public display at their GameStock event in Seattle. Thanks and welcome to GameStock 2001. Um, what you're seeing is, is a sneak peek at what's to come. GameStock doesn't Xbox. exist anymore. We're going to start off with a game uh, whose vision was really just too big to fit in the PS2. So we brought it over to the Xbox. Wow, shots fired. Our characters certainly aren't the uh, muscle-bound superheroes, you know, that we want to be. They're more like the poor, sad schmucks that most of us really are. <laughs> <laughs> Getting Oddworld. That, that was important. It was an established PlayStation franchise. Yes. Beloved by the console game community. That's the last damn gambit there is! We had a chance to work with an amazing creator in Lorne Lanning. He did all the voice acting for his own game. So Munch had these things we called fuzzles. And they were like, me, 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 me. And Munch would be like, you got to come over and do this for me. You know, so, and then Abe's like, come on, guys, let's go. Yeah, go. And they were really vulnerable characters living in extremely dangerous world. I have never played they this one, to keep them alive, enough. But when they get whacked, it's hilarious. I played the other Abe games. Next, we're really happy to announce uh, they were our tough. new relationship with one of the premier racing developers teams in the world, Bizarre Creations. Project Gotham, the new product for Xbox. Now check out the reflections on this car. The whole environment is completely mapped to the entire surface of this vehicle. Project Gotham Racing was based on your style of driving as much as how fast you cross the finish line. For us, it was an opportunity to make this amazing, really accessible, fun, arcade racing game. And that was really the time Need for Revolution. Speed was and slowly was dying. Just the beginning. Hardcore, freestyle snowboarding. This is only one mountain of seven international mountains we'll be bringing to you in Ant. That double-ended uh. axe is pretty wicked looking, and we can tell this is a hand-to-hand -hand fighting game. If you're playing a football game, you want to kick your buddy's butt so hard he's going to wear it for a helmet. And that's it for our show today. I hope you got to see everything that you wanted. Uh, did you see everything? <laughs> oh, I, I feel like I am forgetting something. What, what was it? Uh, oh, Halo. Hey, how could I forget Halo? Hey, everybody. <laughs> I'm Jason. I'm one of the co-founders of Bungie and the lead on Halo. God, they're all so young. <laughs> I'm getting old. Bungie was a Mac first developer. That's where they started. That's where they'd had their success with Marathon and Myth and Myth 2. But Bungie was also dealing with the aftermath of a catastrophe. Myth 2, one of their hottest titles, had an installer bug that could erase a user's entire hard drive. In order to fix the bug and keep the company above water and working on new games, they needed a serious cash the what? infusion. Apparently they had this thing called Halo. I hadn't seen it yet. Some of my guys had. They had multiple games in development, but all I wanted... Yeah, raising the whole hard drive is So we did a deal good. and bought out the company, and they started to work on Halo. That's really when true development began on what the game would be. When we were purchased, Halo was not a game. There was no real story. There was no real sense of what the gameplay tempo would be like. We knew it was powerful to control a space marine who moved fast and could jump into a sophisticated vehicle and, you know, haul ass around this alien world. And that was it. Hmm. So they sold an idea. People knew about Halo. They knew that we'd been acquired by Microsoft. They knew about Xbox. They knew we were still working on the game. That period of getting Halo from a series of prototypes to on a disc playable by an Xbox was just a mad rush to get this game done. But there was this excitement that we had something special. It makes me very nervous to actually play this for you. Um, welcome to Halo on the Xbox.
Oh god. We so we did a playthrough of Halo. Uh, flying to the land in a couple and ship, still playing you know, through Halo Infinite, getting in a vehicle, doing all those you know building Man. block Halo things. But we had our test environment, what we call the B30, the island map in the middle. Of the the graphics are still Halo holding up. I give them the old ones. I actually like the lighting more in the old one play. than the remasters. Woo! GameStock was that real first coming out party for us, and it was just that moment where I think the whole organization began to wake up to, oh, there's something really special here. <laughs> oh, we Thank might you, be in the it. center stage. Xbox had made a high-risk bet on Halo. At the time, first-person shooters were considered PC games. Yes. The only right way to play was with a keyboard and mouse. Yeah. At the time, people thought, well, how are you going to translate, you know, mouse and keyboard game into a console game? Dual stick first person shooters had almost never been done on, on a console. Really? I remember right before the demo, Ed was very clear. Like, Rightfully hey, so. Playing, like, make sure that people see the, the controller. What we need to demonstrate is you can play a shooter with thumbsticks maneuvering around the environment. You can go back and you can look. Adamant blog posts that shooter games like Doom would never work with a game controller. Can people actually play a first person shooter on a controller like this? Is the audience going to accept it? While gamers wrestled with the idea it was of a really first person shooter on a console, good. critics also keyed in on a not so tiny issue. I don't like the controller. Unfortunately, yeah. it's big. I think it's too big. The Duke, they call it. The Duke wasn't a small controller. It didn't feel cheap. No. Nope. It felt. I felt like you could kill somebody with it. You, you could. Have gorilla hands to work with this thing. It was. Thin, it was it totally thin, not made control. for anyone with small hands. Like a newborn baby. And definitely not for like women. Nine pounds, three ounces. Like you had to kind of hug it. As an adult with big hands, you can hold it farther back, and it's really comfortable and cool. It was done bass awkward as most things were on the original Xbox. To get to that design, we kind of used you know, the human factors ergonomic approach. For those of us, and I'm so glad hands, that they reworked. We all thought, oh my god, did all these guys just on the in Xbox a room 360. And go, oh, yeah, this is gonna be great. And it was like, oh, yeah, this is totally not gonna work for us. And it was like, okay, this is a problem. Perhaps we didn't take into account a full range of hand sizes. No, you There's didn't. No way we could ship Duke in Japan. People couldn't use it there. There was almost a plea, you know, Carlson, you've got to find a way to make this smaller, please. We knew it wasn't the right thing, but we didn't have enough time. Yeah. E3 is coming up, and so we had to go with what we had. I'm, again, I'm so glad that for On the E360, they completely reworked Global Gaming's biggest event it to this. E3. And yes, this is still an Los Xbox Angeles. 360 controller. E3 is clearly the Super Bowl, the Olympics, yep. the World still Cup. Still using that for PC gaming. Video game industry. For Team like, Xbox, it was the most important public test for their new console. Before that was the time November launch date. where we're trying to make an I had to say E3, Sony. And we don't know what hardware we're going to be able to show. I don't like your controllers anymore. To show a lot or a little, I'm tested up the PlayStation 5 controllers. We were heads down, focused on having up till all of our games prepped for E3, mm. and it nearly killed us. Xbox it's just nailed it. Night. You're going to read the reviews the next morning, and you're either hot or you're a flop. I was pretty eager to get to E3 and get hands-on with the Xbox. But your first time making hardware is painful. And what you demo and what ends up in the store shelves are often very different things. And so I was really skeptical that this Xbox is gonna be ready. <laughs> it's a pleasure for me to be the first to welcome you to Los Angeles yeah. for what I'm sure is gonna be quite an exciting week. So it's 8 a.m. in the morning, the hardware team is like literally using duct tape to get the the box done. <laughs> Sony had had their event the night before and a party afterwards. This was gonna be our coming out party and we now have a hungover media group at eight o'clock in the morning Ugh. coming to see Xbox. Why would you that do this at eight in the morning? to be. Eight a.m. in the morning. We made Xbox a reality. And you can see here, if I slide this down, Xbox itself, now live and ready to go. I walk out on stage and I do my first line. And in fact, if I press this little button here on the front. It doesn't turn on. And then I 
you know, hit the magic button that's supposed to start the Xbox. You'll see Xbox will actually start up. So we can bring that video up. It is up. We can bring that video up. And nothing happens. Ooh. Nothing. Technical happens. issues well, are the, the video, worst Xbox thing. Will be live and starting and running. I didn't know what to do, so I just went on. So it's with great confidence that on November the 8th, in the North American market, you'll be able to go into retail stores. In less than a year's time, you're going to release this thing into the wild, and people are going to be able to play it, and you're going to love it. And it doesn't turn on. It was a devastating moment. As the hardware planner, like, I mean... And the people all realized this. You'll be able to get a box just like this with Xbox in it. It was um, a disaster. A legendary sort of press conference snafu. Yeah. We had to convince the press very quickly that we had a box that worked and we needed to get their hands on these games as quickly yeah. as we possibly could so we could wash There's away only one more devastating on press We're conference in history after this but, and that was the PlayStation 3 one. one. Xbox wasn't done yet. The graphics hardware that they were running on was running about half the speed of what we expected the final product Ooh. to be at. Basically, I'm, I'm making excuses for it was slow. That's like 15 FPS. Microsoft had never had a meaningful presence at E3 before. The booth was packed. We decide to show Halo because we feel like we have to show what's gonna be our key title. In terms of the games we're working on, Halo had the biggest role. And so it was the E3 demo on the floor. So many people were coming in with huge curiosity about what it was capable of, and I was completely disappointed. I'm like, the frame rate's terrible, the split screen stuff, it's kind of cool, but it just doesn't feel like it's powerful enough. On the show floor, the unfinished game seemed to fall short of its original promise of revolutionary gameplay. So now you have a bad launch event, <laughs> and the key title that's going to carry the hardware game, which is not back. running. And people start to think we're crazy. Shortly thereafter, E3, Peter Moore, he's at Sega, and he says, hey, I want to give you our feedback from E3. That E3 was critical for Sega to stay alive. In February of 2001, yeah. Sega made the decision to discontinue the Dreamcast and focus exclusively on software. Part of that transition included a huge bet to focus on making games for Xbox but a disastrous showing at E3 from Microsoft meant danger for Sega. As we it's were so interesting. From being a first party to a classic third party Let me interrupt this just super quickly. It is so fascinating. When you look at how Sega and Microsoft has been basically bundled together for decades now, starting with this, and we have heard rumors over and over again that Microsoft would buy Sega at some point and it never really happened and it's like what is it what holds them back because they have been always super close I, I wonder what holds them back especially because Sega if you didn't know about this Sega has been starting to sell some parts of the company, not the gaming part. Uh, they did sell their arcades, right, and all their shops and all that. Uh, they did sell that to another company to 100%, I think, this year, last year, something like that. I mix up the years. Look, the last one and a half years have been weird. Um, but however, like, Sega is definitely selling stuff. Not because they necessarily have to, but you know how companies like to sometimes start to sell things. And I'm still surprised that Microsoft has not tried to buy Sega entirely. Like, I'm actually really surprised because they would also not just buy Sega, they would buy Atlas. And with that, they would also get like the rights on Persona because Atlas is owned by Sega, right? I was like, yeah, like, why haven't they done that yet? Absolutely needed somebody like Microsoft to get us through this difficult period. And so Peter comes up to me. He looks at me and says, well, here's our feedback. Retailers aren't going to stock you. Developers aren't going to develop for you. And consumers think the product's not very good and it's too expensive. 
Fair point. I took it very personally. I'm the leader of the team. It's my responsibility. It's my obligation. And I took that and personally. I felt like I failed. This is my resignation letter to my boss, Rick Palooza. I wrote wow. this on Friday, May 25th, 2001 at 2.02 a.m. It starts off, my status and Xbox importance high. This is not going to be an easy email to write. And frankly, I've postponed doing it several times. Emails? The short summary is that in my 2020. and Xbox needs to end and sooner than either of us would like. I think this is both in my best interest and the best interest of Microsoft. Damn man. But Bill Gates and Microsoft CEO Steve Ballmer did not accept Robbie's resignation. They just encouraged me to get it done and said, you've done a great job, keep at it, we're with you. I mean, there wasn't much more they could say, right? There's no advice they could give me. They were too far away to say, hey, go do this. Yeah. The only person who could figure that out was me. I never told anybody on the team, Rick and Steve and Bill. They're the only people that ever knew. That gives you the sense how personally challenging it was for a person who hates losing. I mean, who likes losing? Electronic Arts. It's one of the biggest game makers in the world. And its CEO, Larry Propes, was quoted in the Financial Times as saying this, that Microsoft has a lot to do over the next few months. They are on a Ooh. death march now. I don't think anybody had an easy ride to launch. All we're thinking about is getting the device done so that we can but Yeah, that speaks, it. by the way, very highly of the person. Have to put in this resignation after those little holiday, screw ups. You missed a year. That holiday was vital. Yeah. And they still were, were like, no, you can do this. We were trying to engineer and design something that we'd never done before. We were building the, the, the technology, we were building the hardware inside. The Xbox circuit board is about yay big. It had probably in the order of 800 parts. Parts of the Xbox were coming from all over the world like Hungary and Mexico. You know, there were people who went and lived hmm. in China in a hotel room for weeks on end. We would be Damn. flying back and forth with hard drives to get stuff back to test. Microsoft had never shipped a console before. It turns out there's a lot of regulation everywhere in the world. Yeah. You had to be certified by the right agency and approved. Their approval took longer than we expected. Parts oh, wound up getting delayed yeah. from suppliers. It was every day, come into the office, see a fire, try to put the fire out. We were tracking the hardware, tracking the components, tracking our launch dates at such an accelerated pace. It was um, chaotic. Chaos, total chaos. People themselves chaos. were doing Herculean things. We chaos. would sleep at the office. This was all happening in real time. It had just never been done before. And they didn't at the time. Xbox was the toughest job I will ever have, or have ever had. I will never do it again. Every day was a challenge, both sort of technically and professionally, but also personally. You know, you were lucky if you had a personal relationship that survived launch. <sighs> Mine Lots did not. Crunch. <laughs> it's kind of like you're on this horse that's bucking and you're thinking, okay, is this ever gonna stop or will this be the end of me? Eight to 12 weeks before launch, we're coming in way hotter than anyone expected to. We doubted whether the hardware is gonna be done in time. We're not sure any of the games are gonna be done in time. The ship is still on fire, the plane hasn't landed, all the metaphors for crashes you can think of. <laughs> But in the end, that team believed. There's no second try at the Xbox. So this was a Hail Mary culture. And if we were able to succeed, it was gonna be absolutely epic. It's a touchdown. Yeah, that was a high November risk, 15th, man. 2001, Xbox was released in Times Square. Oh my god, that's Bill! We painted Times Square <laughs> green. Everywhere you looked, you saw the Xbox green logo. Xbox was up on all these big billboards. One of those moments in your life you're never gonna forget. Here we are, a huge line of gamers down the street waiting to buy this Xbox. 20 years old, first time going to the city alone. I get Xbox on a bus super fan? I show up oh, in Times gosh. Square, I go straight to the new Toys R Us. And I'm looking for the line. I'm prepared to stay there all day. We worked with the city to open up the WWF restaurant across the street from Toys R Us Times Square. And that's where all the gamers came first. They have Xbox consoles set up everywhere. It pretty much just allowed all the gamers to hang out and play and, and test out all these games. Smart. 
Bill wanted to be on site. He wanted to help hand over the first console. I mean, it makes sense. Bill Gates is down at a gaming system, shook my hand and said, you ready to play? And then we were playing Fusion Frenzy and Bill Gates made a comment that he had actually taken two weeks off of work just to practice this game. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to beat the gamers. Does anyone know what the shoot button is? <laughs> he couldn't beat me. <laughs> I absolutely took pleasure in beating Bill Gates, yes. <laughs> Thank you for this. I mean, I would do too. Everybody got a tag on their wrist, and when your color was called, we brought you across the street to Toys R Us, and Bill was there to hand out the very first Xbox. Tonight's kind of a celebration. Uh, it's after a lot of hard work. Uh, so they count down. And a lot of money. Has it rung in on the register. Price is up there, two ninety nine, ninety nine. Oh God! When Constance still did cost two ninety nine on release. He hands me the box and says, "Don't worry, I'm buying it for you." And I turn around with even more excitement and, and raise my my prize possession. I, I think Bill head. Gates, Edward Glucksman, could have became the first gamer in the world to ever own. I think he has Xbox. enough money to buy one Xbox. It was a magical night. I'm a twenty year old Barely. kid looking for a console. That's all I wanted to do. First time going to city alone, I managed to get sent home in a limo. It's a celebrity. Every night. That's right. <laughs> They actually cool. did it. You know, Microsoft actually built and, and delivered this thing. The feeling was like, you know, crying level of exhaustion. I can and see that, yeah. Pride for the thing that we had made. Now, there has never been a prouder moment in It has to sell the software. You know, I still have goosebumps today thinking about it. I tell people that faith is a force multiplier. That team believed. And because that team believed, Xbox got done. If that team doesn't believe and they're just there doing their jobs, we never finish. That small mm. group of big personalities managed not only to convince Bill Gates and the board that we wanted to get into this nascent industry, but they also managed to get an entire organization of game people And they would have multiple the right direction. moments where they would question that way, decision. The whole station is covered in Xbox logos. So... I had to sit down and started to cry, and even Kevin got emotional. It was an impossible task that we should not have been able to do. I was tremendously proud of it. But at the same time, that was the end of that special moment in time that we were all able to be part of. Yeah, and they didn't do too well in Europe with that. Like, outside of the US, it's still the Xbox out of their hands and sometimes a bit problematic for Microsoft. Kevin Backus and Seamus Blackley left Microsoft for new adventures in the game industry. Damn. Microsoft Xbox went on sale at midnight. But when it comes to video games, it's not the system that counts, it's the games. Yeah. Nobody actually really cares about the hardware. All they care about is the content. To be successful. You have to give the gamers that platform defining title. Yup. That you had to go out and buy an Xbox if you wanted to play. Halo was like this gem, like this was going to be the diamond we offered up at Xbox launch. But remember, Halo showed up at E3, you know, six months before the game was supposed to launch with pretty serious frame rate issues. Yeah. Why is it running like internet video from the early 90s? We got hammered for how it showed up on the floor. This is our lead title. Yeah, it was we not. actually launch something that is this terrible game. I think there was a bunch of panic. People didn't see what they expected. That was the part where people actually got super worried. There was an incredible amount of pressure on Halo. If Halo wasn't a hit, then the future of Xbox really was in doubt. Damn. All right. I'm looking forward to the next episode watch well in the next video that was really interesting um it yeah it takes it takes a lot to launch a console for the very first time like console launches in itself are already super tough to do and they they always take like the maximum from a company when they happen and then there is this company who not just did it for the first time, but also had no clue how to do hardware, how to do games. And then also keep in mind, 
had fierce competition, that was also something Microsoft never necessarily was used to, because Microsoft was used to be the monopoly, right? Like Windows, Office, all those things. It's like, yeah, you're going to Microsoft. Duh. Like you didn't really have another choice. And now with the gaming consoles, they were like, yeah, well, you're not alone in this. One, Sega, just left the stage and PlayStation was murdering everyone and Nintendo was doing what Nintendo always does. Its own thing, right? More or less. And you want to get into that market. It must have been... Like, they're doing a pretty good job with this video series to basically explain, like, how it was, how it felt, how much pressure there was. But I can only imagine that this was probably just a fracture of what the people had go through to deliver that console. And it is pretty stellar, to say the least. So I'm looking forward to episode four. We will watch here uh, in the next video. And if you enjoyed this video and you are on your way out, I would appreciate if you leave a like. If you're new to the channel, you want to see more reaction videos, tips and tricks for new videos coming out, gaming news when they happen, um, I would appreciate if you also might consider to subscribe. And that would help me out a great deal. If you ever want to catch me live, you can do so from Monday to Friday, starting at 9 a.m. ET, which is 2 p.m. UK time and 3 p.m. Central European time, with also gaming news in the morning. And then we are playing the newest video games. And you can find me at trovo.live slash chaos mode. You will find the link in the video description. And again, thank you so much for watching. Stay safe. And I'll see you next time.